Hello, folks. It's Bradley J and the Bradley J Show. We're uh, here at Friday again and once again joined by Rich Rubino. And today we're going to talk about the origin of Trumpism, depending on how you def define Trumpism. And for our purposes, we're going to talk about it as a basket of policies and ideology, not the personality, not the vindictiveness, not the uh, dishonesty, not all that. We're going to talk about the policies and where'd that come from? Is it, did Trump make that up? Well, apparently, according to Rich Rubino, no, someone else made it up. And it was not, it was not uh, somebody in the far distant past. By the way, I have at the end of this, and remind me, a trivia question for you. Oh, Which wonderful. is probably um, it, a, diff a degree of difficulty of pretty high, but you'll probably still get it. So anyway, talk to us about where Trumpism came from, and for that matter, where this thing called New Democracy, the New Democrats, this group called the New Democrats came from. Yeah, this is, so they're, they're two disparate groups, but I'm going to try to amalgamate them, if you will. Basically, Donald Trump's philosophy of essentially uh, economic nationalism being essentially to use tariffs to try to protect American workers, restrictive policy on, on, on legal immigration as well as illegal immigration, and essentially less intervention overseas. It actually was the Republican platform. If you go back to the days in the 1920s of Harding, Harding actually used the term America first when he ran for president in 1920 and literally called himself that he was an American first Can, uh, uh, candidate. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, when he was president, signed, he signed an act restricting immigration. Herbert Hoover largely continued that, but then in, um, he actually signed the smooth Holly tariff when he was president that many think, many think many think precipitated the uh, Great Depression. It was probably a little bit unfair, but let's go more contemporaneous and let's go back to Patrick Buchanan. So Patrick Buchanan, a former aide to Presidents Nixon, Little Wild Ford and Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1992, 96 and 2000. And in 1996, 1992 rather, he was basically running as a very similar ideolo ideologically to Donald Trump. For example, he would talk about trade policies. He would talk about going to Berlin, New Hampshire, during the primary and he would go around and he was meeting people up there at a factory that closed down. He said, one guy says, save our jobs. So Buchanan, who used to be a free trader, said essentially, he talked about the multinational corporations that are taking their jobs and taking them overseas. Very much assailed, excoriated, if you will, the North American Free Trade Agreement, talked about the multinational corporations, talked about trade agreements. Um, he actually went down to the border and talked about what he called the invasion of, of the aliens at the time. And this was when they were this was back in 1991 when very few Americans were actually talking about that. So he was bringing that up. And eventually, yeah, the other way, you had Proposition 187, which restricted most non-emergency aid um, uh, benefits to illegal immigrants, which was passed under Pete Wilson's administration when he was governor of California. But this is basically what Buchanan was talking about. And a foreign policy, he basically said the Cold War is now over. We need to come home. Instead of trying to be kind of this, um, you know, instead of this neoconservative worldview, where we're essentially where the, where the United States continues to expand their military says, no, we need to dissipate. We need to essentially retrench from different places. We need to come home. And he ran on that platform. His opponent was George H.W. Bush, the Republican incumbent president that year. And he garnered, Buchanan garnered 37 percent of the vote in the New Hampshire primary that year, which really shocked a lot of people that he did that well. But it did show that there was some sort of a messaging. There was some sort of an avenue. And there was really an aperture in American politics for that message. So 1996 comes around, he runs for president again. Wins the New Hampshire primary, albeit with only 27% of the vote. It was very much a mixed field, barely beat Bob Dole. But why am I telling you this? Basically because he was presenting himself as a working class conservative. He said conservatives of the heart, not of the heart, basically. The conservatives that aren't really necessarily reading Ludwig von Mises, are not kind of libertarians, they're not reading Adam Smith. But when it comes to a lot of social issues, when it comes to abortion, for example, when it comes to gay marriage, they're very conservative. On economic issues, they might be populist, but essentially, so essentially you don't try to go after them by talking about, for example, privatizing Social Security. You go after them by talking about the trade agreements, and then you talk about the social issues as well. He ran briefly in 2000, the Reform Party nominee didn't get anywhere. But basically, Donald Trump took up that mantle. Okay. And can you talk a little bit how things happened for the New Democrats? Yeah, this is so. This is why I'm bringing up the Donald. Trump. This is this is where I'm bringing up the kind of two disparate elements. So, the Democratic Party, 1984, 
Walter Mondale, former vice president, loses 49 states. He only won his home state, Minnesota, and the District of Columbia, and he barely won his home state of Minnesota. 1988, Mike Dukakis wins the nomination, wins only 10 states. And part of the reason both of them lost was the Republican opponents was able to stylize them, to allegate, to caricature them as traditional liberals. And conservatives have done a great job of making liberalism a term of derision. Basically, if you go back, Lyndon Johnson, who just died, who we, we, just saw, we just had the 50th anniversary of his death back in 1973, precipitated the Great Society, which essentially many social, progr many social programs, Medicare, civil rights, um, the Rad Extermination Act, just this whole litany of them. But basically, Republicans are making the case that, 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 that the Democratic Party is too reliant on big government. So this is what happened. In 1984, Gary Hart ran for president. He was a senator from Colorado, and he ran basically criticizing some of the power that unions have in the Democratic Party. He didn't get anywhere, but he actually did better than expected and actually came in second place and literally lost the convention to Walter Mondale. 1988, Al Gore runs. Al Gore was 39 years old, the youngest major presidential candidate really since John F. Kennedy in 1960. He actually compared himself to Kennedy at the time. But he basically said that the Democratic Party had gone too far to the left. And he, he had had a relatively moderate record in the United States Senate. Um, and he actually, when he was when, during his candidacy, he said that he, that he was the candidate the Republicans feared most because they were because essentially he would be very hard to defeat because he was the most moderate candidate. He had conservative Democrats supporting like for future Texas Republican Governor Rick Perry, Hal Heflin of Alabama supported him, um, Sam Nunn of Georgia, Dan Bourne of Oklahoma. So a lot of Southern Democrats. And this is what the new, so there was this group called the New Democrats the Democratic Leadership Council, and it was formed basically after the San Francisco debacle when Walter Mondale won the Dem was the Democratic presidential nominee in San Francisco of all places. So Republicans, Gene Kirkpatrick, the future UN secretary, would come on and they would say, the Democratic Party is the party of the San Francisco liberal. So this coterie, Sam Nunn, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Dick Gephardt got together and formed the Democratic Leadership Council and their basic objective was to change the way Democrats are viewed nationally. Instead of the liberal kind of, in, instead of what the, instead of being seen as kind of the activist party, it's being seen as too liberal. They wanted the party to be seen as tough on defense, tough on crime, free traders, for example. And that's basically what Al Gore ran on in 1988. He was a very, um, he very much criticized some of his opponents. Mike Dukakis, for example, he criticized for the furlough program in Massachusetts. George H.W. Bush ended up taking that on later on, bringing up the name Willie Horton, but Gordon mentioned that, but he certainly brought it up on foreign policy. He said that the party was essentially too weak. But here's what the Democrats did. They made it so that Super Tuesday, you would have a conglomeration of Southern states going so that the activists would not have as much power. Al Gore in 1987, he was a critical of Iowa. He did not participate in the Iowa, in the Iowa caucuses that year because he said that it, the basically liberal activists control Iowa and you get to the point that if, 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 if a liberal candidate wins in the state of Iowa in the caucuses, maybe they're not even going to win in the general election in that state. So Al Gore was waiting for the southern states. And the DLC, one of those southern states, would nominate a more moderate candidate. What they did not count on was how well Jesse Jackson did. The Reverend Jesse Jackson did very well in many of these southern states, places like, you know, so basically he split the vote with Al Gore and eventually Michael Dukakis won. So why am I telling you this? Well, Bill Clinton in 1992 just like Donald Trump took the mantle of Pat Buchanan, Bill Clinton took the mantle of Al Gore and Gary Hart. And in 1992, when he ran for president, he made it virtually immutable for the Republican Party to try to assail him as being too liberal. He talked about trade. He talked about how he took on the teachers unions in terms of in terms of having requirements for competency for, te for testing for teachers. And a couple of days before the 1992 New Hampshire primary, he went back to New Hampshire to supervise the execution of Ricky Ray Rector, who had killed two people in, who had killed two people in Arkansas, and then on a, a suicide attempt had given himself essentially an essentially a lobotomy. So he went down there, and you could not make you could not make the same criticism that you could make for for Michael for someone like Mike Dukakis, for example. And I'll just end with this: in that same year, you had Paul Songus running, former Massachusetts senator, and he was running also very much as a new Democrat talking about how he's not a traditional class warfare Democrat, how he's not necessarily um, anti-corporation. You had Bob Kerry talking somewhat of a new Democrat. Jerry Brown that year ran on a, on a flat tax. Imagine running on a flat tax. 
And Tom Harkin, that was probably the only really liberal candidate that year. So what Bruce Bat, what Al Gore, Bruce Babbitt ran as well in 88, but, and Gary Hart did, really helped at Bill Clinton in 1992, just like Pat Buchanan really precipitated the movement for Donald Trump, and Donald Trump actuated it in 2016. So do you think Donald Trump will reject his own Trumpism this time in any way? He will change it and to... No. Uh, no, he has really what he has done, beginning with Buchanan, is he's defined what a conservative is. He's redefined it. When Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1980, George H.W. Bush was running against him. They were both talking about how you need a more liberal program for um, immigration between the Mexicans and the United States. They both wanted what became the North American Free Trade Agreement. That is now anathema within the Republican Party. Even Newt Gingrich who helped get the general agreement and tariffs and trade passed through the United States Congress with Bill Clinton, now says, I agree with Donald Trump on trade. You are now considered a rhino, Republican in name only, which is one of the greatest terms of derision against the, against the Republicans or an establishment Republican if you do not go along with Donald Trump. You watch Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is not a traditional kind of laissez-faire libertarian Republican. He's very populist in many respects. And he's actually praised Elizabeth Warren's programs, economic programs. He's praised Andrew Yang a couple of times. So I think that Donald Trump has now redefined what the word conservative means in the United States, which raises the question, what will all of his opponents this year, will they all try to run to essentially kind of out Trump Trump? And I think there certainly is some uh, legitimacy there. But remember, George W. Bush, second term administration, he went all around the country barnstorming talking about changing the way change partially privatizing social security that is out of the question now if it's a blue collar republican party and a lot of their blue collar republicans in places like west virginia are very much dependent upon social security and medicare so donald trump recently says do not touch social security he said that in 2016 he knows where his bread is buttered it's not with necessarily the, the folks at the corporations it's not with the people at the country clubs they, those people may be benefiting from donald trump may benefit from his tax cuts, they may actually be voting for him, but he also needs the votes of those who are blue collar conservative, who are sometimes economically populist. I think I might have made up a new word, a new uh, acronym. Oh, rock. Rock. Instead of rhino, I rock. Trump is a rock, meaning a Republican of convenience. Well, <laughs> she, you know, he doesn't believe that stuff. He he takes these positions, but his history shows that he does not have the ideology. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He, that doesn't seem to bother any his followers. No, if you go back to his past statements, you know, he was someone who's very supportive of Bill Clinton when he was president, very critical of um, of the folks who wanted to impeach him over the Monica over over the Monica Lewinsky issue. He's somebody who um, he's somebody who thought of running for president actually against Pat Buchanan in 2000, and then when it appeared that Buchanan was going to garner the nomination, basically called Buchanan a Hitler lover. He's talked about how the Republicans need to be better on immigration. He's talked about being for um, of being for abortion rights. They've asked him about about late term abortions, and he said basically the government should not restrict that. In one of his books, he was very sympathetic of the idea of having a universal health care program. So he has very much changed his views on much on many issues, with one exception. There is a certain nationalism that he's always had, specifically on tariffs. Go back to the 1980s, he was on Oprah Winfrey's program, and he basically said that, yeah, we need to put more tariffs on Japan, we need to talk put, put tariffs on Japan, we need to put tariffs on, on China. That is the one similarity. There's consanguinity between what he was saying then and what he was saying now. On most other issues, He's basically changed, which is part of it is an interesting question. For example, when he ran in 2016, a lot in the evangelical community did not trust him. They thought, well, this is why is this New York liberal running? Ted Cruz basically called him that. He said that he's basically been listening too much to the New York liberals. He wasn't necessarily there. He wasn't their flagship candidate. It was either Ted Cruz, Ben Carson, maybe even Rand Paul. But Donald Trump really won them over in part by nominating conservative justices to the United States Supreme Court to the point that he's now the tribune, if you will, to some ev to some evangelicals. So that's wouldn't, one Wouldn't thing. any, would any that, president do that? Wouldn't yeah, any president... I mean, Reagan was, very, Reagan was very similar in this. When Reagan was governor of California, Reagan signed one of the most all-encompassing um, abortion rights acts, basically, in American history. On gun control, he signed the Mulford Act. 
which was one of the most all-encompassing gun control pieces of legislation that's ever passed in American history. And he actually continued to support gun control as president and actually at, actually later after his presidency advocated for the ban on on AK for, on the ban on um on semi-automatic rifles and was probably the person who probably persuaded Dick Sweat from New Hampshire to vote for the ban. But certainly people looked upon him, at least people, I think a lot of conservatives looked upon them as kind of one of them, even though his gov- and when he was governor of California, he promised he wouldn't raise withholding taxes when he runs in 1970. Then he certainly raises them, um, raises when he had said, raises withholding taxes. He had said, my hand, my, my, he had said, I'm standing in concrete. He said, well, the concrete's lit, about to crack. So he'd always been someone who's kind of a combinationist, but he was that way as president as well. I mean, he did sign the um, Tax Equity Act in 1982, for example, which counting for inflation was the largest tax increase in American history. And he um, certainly increased social security taxes with it, working with Joe Biden and Tip O'Neill in terms of doing that. And when he wanted the when he wanted to um, when he wanted a, plifer, a no, non-proliferation treaty with the Russians um, on in terms of ballistic missiles, he had to work with Democrats because it was the conservatives like Jerry Falwell who were actually who were running ads in New Hampshire, basically saying that he shouldn't go along with this. And he supported Sandra Day O'Connor to the United States Supreme Court, which certainly um, alienated a lot of conservatives who didn't think she was nearly conservative enough. When when it looks at when you look at Trump's guiding policies, would it be fair to say, and maybe not, that he is in favor of policies that make him richer, that are good for his business. Uh, that, doesn't that seem to be the whole purpose? The way it seems to me, if you back up, is he ran for president because it, it, it helped his brand, his uh, his brand. And he didn't expect to win, but then when he did win, he thought, well, wow, now I can really, you know, this is really good for business. I can squeeze di- foreign diplomats who want to, uh, you know, come here into staying at my hotel. I can leverage my brand uh, overseas for other products and services. And also, when it when it comes to trade policies, and all, wouldn't wouldn't all this be good for him? I think uh, you know, monetarily, it seems like a business venture. And especially when I see he didn't pay any attention to the business of governing, he didn't look at his security briefings. Uh, it was all about, hey, this is this was going to enhance my brand now it is my brand thoughts well everyone has a multiplicity of motivations i'll get out of it that way but i will say that so, okay sure. most people didn't seem he did it seemed like he had that was hit besides you know being having it feed his ego but it would feed lots of people's ego i mean why else do you run for president i'm I was not holding that place, against him i'm history. just saying primary it's t- it's tough to find other things other than that it's good for my business well, yet also a place in history too. Everyone wants everyone oh, wants immortality. Everyone to wants ego. immortality, and he, to ego. he certainly is somebody who loves getting admiration from people. He, you can see him when he's you see him when he's when he's um when he's in crowds. He doesn't shake hands, but he loves that and he loves going to rally. He loves doing rallies. That's why he was president. Yeah, he was doing these rallies. He loves. I, I can't. I can't hold that him against. I can't hold that against him because I like that too. And <laughs> yes, absolutely. most people do. Absolutely. Who doesn't like people? For, I mean, who doesn't love when people are praising you and telling you how and, you know, genuflecting to you and telling you you're an awesome God and everything? Well, you know, else. It's, the no same God people, it's the same reason people get in bands or become movie stars. They Everybody wants adulation and to approach, to get a little closer to immortality. The only person, the only person I can think of who hated it was Nixon. And here's why I say Nixon. Nixon's interesting because Nixon is very much an aberration. He is somebody who is very much not even an amnivert. He is an he was an introvert and an extrovert's palace. Here's what he would do when he when when Pat Buchanan and him in 1966 he they were he was an aide and there was another guy that would come with him. He went all around the country campaigning for Republicans, basically collecting chits. They would then support him in his 1968 presidential run, and it worked. He made certain that he would always sit on the window seat. Now, why do you think that is? Why would he always want to sit in the window seat? So the people would not come up to him and start talking to him and telling him how great he was and asking him for autographs. He did not like that. He was depressed sometimes when he'd go after a big, be at a big rally. He would rather just be there with his yellow pad working out policy details. He did not like that. Now, so, now take on the other side of that, someone like Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton absolutely revels in it. You know, they say let, they say he's like Elvis. When he comes in there, he wants to shake every single hand. 
He would literally have, you know, 10 minute conversations with one or two people in the audience. He absolutely loves the admiration. He loves being a part of the crowd. He loves permit the kind of the just mm. being around so many people. I think that's most politicians like that. Nixon was probably one of the few exceptions. Benjamin Harrison was an exception as well. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Harrison was known as somebody who was kind of very cold. They called him the Indiana icicle because he was not very, he was, he had Indiana origins, but he was not very friendly uh, when he was around a groups of people. And it's interesting because that's one of the criticisms you hear about Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida and a possible Republican presidential candidate. He's never been seen as a warm person. He's always been seen as somebody who was kind of more interested in more interested in, you know, kind of being by himself or kind of having cabinet mm -hmm. meetings and going out there and having campaign events and essentially trying to um, trying to trying, you know, trying to kind of win over, um, win over, win over converts and galvanize the base and everything. So he'll be interesting if he if he runs for president to see how he kind of um, how he kind of gets over that. Richard Nixon seems like such a skilled and honorable man compared to Donald Trump. Well, you got to remember about Nixon, though. There were a lot of things he did that were not honorable. And chief, yeah, but I'm talking comparatively. Chief, yeah, chief among them in 1968. He was essentially at the end of the campaign. Hubert Humphrey, ever since he, Hubert Humphrey had been down by 15 points. Hubert Humphrey was Lyndon Johnson's vice president. The politics of joy. The guy always talks about being pleased as punch. So in the last weeks of that campaign, September 30th, Hubert Humphrey's in Salt Lake City, Utah. And he says he will support as president a unilateral bombing halt of North Vietnam as an acceptable risk for peace, breaking with Johnson's policy of not doing that. All of a sudden, the folks in the primary who supported Eugene McCarthy, the anti-war people, start moving, moving closer and closer and closer to Humphrey. All of a sudden, polls show he's just about tied. A week before the election, Lyndon Johnson gets the North Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, and the Americans to agree to peace talks. This probably would have given Hubert Humphrey the edge, and he probably would have, um, and, he, and he probably would have won up Nixon in, in won up Nixon and won that election, which would have been, you know, one of the greatest comebacks in American history. So Richard Nixon sends out Anne Chenault, his emissary, to go to the South Vietnam. This is President Two. This is the United States' ally, and says you'll get a better deal under President Nixon. So the South Vietnamese, uncharacteristically, just pull out of the talks a week before the campaign. Richard Nixon, Lyndon Johnson finds out about this, calls up Everett Dirksen, the Senate Minority Leader from Illinois, says, what's going on? Basically says, we know what's going on. And Dirksen and John D. Johnson says, you know, Nixon can't do this anymore. So Johnson then goes out and campaigns for Humphrey. But had had they, had they actually had the talks, there's a possibility that Vietnam potentially could have ended in 1968. And of wow. course, Hubert Humphrey probably would have been president. So, uh, You know, when, when we go out and talk in public like this, we have to answer the questions that pop up. It's part of the... Part of the deal. Let's see. Uh, and uh, this says, come on, Rubino. You could have said, I think, Lola, come on, Rich. But come on, Rubino, you're not seeing Trump as the monster he is. He's at a security risk. Now, I know, Rich, that you you don't want to have opinions. You just want to do historical facts. But, you know, you st when you start comparing, then then you are starting to yeah. you know, judgments involved in this. So you've slippery sloped your way into being judgmental. Yeah. So what do you say to this? Yeah, no, I mean, that has become, I think, the prevailing sentiment in the United States right now is that is, is, that's why Donald Trump has such, a, has such a low ceiling and he cannot get over it. There are a litany of Americans who essentially do believe that. They believe that Donald Trump is essentially um, is, somebody, is, is somebody who is a criminal and is somebody that potentially um, should, be, should, should be in prison. And there's a possibility that he may be tried and actually may be in prison, which means the Secret Service have to actually go to prison. But you know, I'll stay out of that kind of Donnybrook, but I know that, you know, certainly that is the prevailing sentiment right now. And that's why I think Democrats are absolutely salivating at the idea of Donald Trump becoming the right. Republican presidential nominee this time right. around. And they're trying to figure out if he would actually take the bait and choose one of those who oppose Kevin McCarthy if he does win the nomination as his vice presidential running mate. And that's something they're really salivating at. And I'll say that most a lot of Republicans, you call them establishment Republicans, but I think a lot of Republicans are really hoping Donald Trump would just kind of exit stage right from the American political sphere. So I'll say that from an analytical perspective that uh, most re most establishment Republicans would rather have just about anybody but Donald Trump. And most Democrats want to have Donald Trump as a nominee and they think they can um, 
they think they can defeat him handily no matter who their nominee is. But I just saw some poll that said in a you know matchup today that Trump would beat Biden by four points. Was it? Was that a? Did you see I that? Was, I think it was an Emerson poll. Yeah. So is that not a legit poll? Yeah, it's very legitimate. Um, okay. So, and it's also very early. There was a poll that showed, you know, that showed George W. Bush beating Howard Dean in Vermont right around this time during a presidential race. I think that my guess is that um, just too early. First of all, it could be an outlier poll. I don't know. But second of all, what it does show is that there are a lot of people in this country, despite the fact that um, despite what we hear on the coast, certainly in the interior of the country, in the rural part of the country, there are a lot of people who do not hate Donald Trump. And it raises the question, this is the, one of the Democrats' biggest problems. This is something that Bill Clinton tr actually did very well with. But why are Democrats do so poorly with rural voters, with people who economically you think would actually be benefiting from Democrats, people who are on who are on entitlement programs, who are on Medicare, who are on Social Security? What is it that those people, that those voters do not like about the Democratic Party? Right. And why are they voting? For yeah, why do they want to bite the hand that feeds them? But they, a lot of these people in the, certainly the rural parts of the country, because Charlie and Pat Buchanan started this and Donald Trump continued it, essentially they think that the Republican Party, because of social issues, better serves them. And once you take trade out of the equation, Republicans used to be this free trade party, exponent of free trade, free markets. Once you take free markets out and the Republican Party is once again a, is a populist party, you cause a lot of headaches for Democrats. Democrats used to do very well with rural voters under FDR, under Truman, under LBJ, Carter, certainly Bill Clinton, but they very much dissipated in terms of, and also a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of these folks ended up voting for Ronald Reagan in 1984. Then Bill Clinton kind of brought them back into the fold, if you will. But Democrats do very poorly. Um, one exception is John Tester, the senator from, from Montana, a state that went for 20 points for Donald Trump last time. Yet Dick John Tester was able to win reelection by four points in 2018. Democrats want him to run for re-election this time around. There are a few, Jared Golden in Maine, who's a, who are able to kind of inoculate themselves from the criticism of the National Party. But that's certainly Democrats' biggest, that's one of their biggest issues right now, is they're seen as a party of coastal elites. And the way Republicans define liberal now, they define liberal as somebody as kind of, a, you. The, this is their caricature, almost a chimera, if you will. A, Demo a liberal Democrat is a snooty professor who looks down upon rural America and essentially thinks that they're better than everybody. And as long as you can make that the face card of the Democratic Party of liberalism, you'll see all Democrats just about were in the center of the country try to distance themselves from their party, as opposed to what I think the Democrats would rather have their image as, which is somebody who's populist, somebody who's really there for the working people of America, somebody who's there to take on the corporation, somebody who's there to take on all these multinational corporations and take on all these factories going to overseas. Mm. Republicans have really been brilliant in this. And when you see when you see um, Governor DeSantis, the day he was reelected over Charlie Crist, basically saying that Florida is where woke goes to die. We hear a lot about critical race theory all the time now, and that's become this huge issue. Donald Trump announced his education plan, and part of it is to go after critical race theory. It's basically that there's a culture war and the Republicans are on the side of essentially, in terms of, are on the side of the culture warriors, they're on the side of essentially working class voters. And that really, that really is deleterious effects on the Democrats. Right. It shows that the culture factor is more powerful than even yep. entitlements. Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Which is weird. That's, that, that's, uh, that. like it's more, I'm getting money from the government, the big bad government. But I'll say I don't want that anymore if we can get rid of those woke people. Yeah, but Trump has changed that because Trump now he did try kind of set with some circumlocution to try to cut certain parts of entitlements. But when he ran, he basically said, I will not touch Social Security. I will not touch Medicare. And when you say that, then you do well in West Virginia. West Virginia, Bill Clinton won by 18 points in 1996. Donald Trump, by essentially taking trade out of the equation, taking entitlements out of the equation, that became his number one state in 2016 and his number two state in 2020. That is a state tailor made for Trump's message, not for, say, Gerald Ford's message or for Ronald Reagan's message or for George H.W. Bush's message, which was more or less traditional Republican views. If you look at some of the poorest congressional districts in the country, Harold Rogers District in rural Kentucky about, is one of the most conservative districts, one of Donald Trump's best districts in the entire country. 
Meanwhile, you look at some of the more, you know, Adam Schiff's district in Los Angeles, for example, very much wealthy, very much votes for the Democrat. Um, New York City, they're from very wealthy parts of New York City where people would be, where I think a lot of the voters would benefit a lot more from Republicans' tax plan. They're voting Democrat because of cultural issues, which shows, I think, it, that it's a myth to think that, well, Americans will just go out and vote for their pocketbooks. Now, the Americans that do vote for their pocketbooks, there are certainly people who are members of country clubs or yacht clubs who are very wealthy, who look at their, you know, who look at essentially their financial situation and say, well, I do a lot better under Republican or in Bill Clinton's case, I do a lot better in the Democrat, so I'm going to vote that way without necessarily looking on the looking upon ideology. But they're now becoming the exception and not the rule. I have so many and I wouldn't have guessed that I would have so many questions within this topic. But uh, I guess I'll go with this one. It seems as though, and it seems now we're in a post-truth world, also a post-shame world, and a post-sense of humor world, but we'll deal with the post-truth world. But particularly, and folks, I am not all that super liberal, but I will say that the Republican Party does not keep, seem to care one whit for truth. The, the fact that the, Trump told so many lies and the fact that the Santos is I, not the Santos. Santos is still is it is it George Santos? George Santos, yeah. Yeah. That he's still got a job that, and and people are saying, you know, what, uh, you know, he's still part of the team. W would Democrats do the same thing as their historical president precedent showing that Democrats also don't care about honesty whatsoever? I mean, oh, you might bring up uh, Elizabeth Warren, but she, I think, maybe genuinely thought because her Grammy told her that she was part Indian. Yeah. Believed it. On the other hand, as a pretty white looking person, she shouldn't have gone and tried to gig, try to get a job using that that uh, loophole, which was meant to benefit people who have suffered because of their Native Americanness or be because of their minorityness. She shouldn't have taken advantage of that, whatever percent she perceived it to be. But she kind of believed that. And if you're a Democrat, they, th you know, they, they'll boot you out if you if you don't test pass the purity test. But, uh, but mm -hmm. Republicans, oh no, it doesn't matter if you never told one truth and ever, it seems. So it seems like, let me say it simply, the Republican Party seems like the party that has no problem with liars. I think that, well, certainly um, George Santos isn't the first liar in American politics. But, no, we didn't uh, say that. <laughs> that George Santos' lies are just so flagrant. Yeah, yeah, but that's just part of a pattern. Trump, yeah. Trump beat Biden in a poll still after 9-11. And after the, the lies related to that, what's up? In the case of George... I don't mean 9-11, I mean January 6th. January 6th, yeah. In the case, they, I mean, it certainly it shows the kind of ideological homogenization, homogenization we are now in, in terms of there are people who are conservatives, people who are liberals, people who only listen to echo chambers and have come to the conclusion that essentially that essentially they are um, that they are essentially on the side of good and the others are on the side of iniquity and essentially it's almost become a biblical type of a thing but they're also to be fair a lot of people who are kind of depoliticized anyways who don't really care one way or the other and there are people that don't even vote but if, of those who of those who are very interested in politics you know the average age of a voter is about 54 years old but you go to twitter and you think the average age of a voter is about 21 years old because it's the 21 year olds that are starting to become kind of the thought leaders just because they're on there more often and they're more technologically sophisticated, um, if you will. In the case of George Santos, this shows how I mean, how much Kevin McCarthy needs that majority. If he had a 10 or 3, 11 more seat majority, it would be in his political benefit to come out there and say, I absolutely excoriate George Santos. George Santos lied to his voters. He should not. He should no longer be a part of our caucus, and we're not going to sit him on committees. Instead, because he comes from a swing district, and because the belief is that if he were to resign, a Democrat would probably pick up that seat, especially with all the um, the aftermath of what's happened with George Santos, and it's certainly the galvanization of the Democrats. Not to mention the fact that a special election would probably galvanize a lot of benefactors nationally to the Democratic Party, 
who would say, look what's going on right here. This shows the Democrats are going to take a majority or so. So it's going to be kind of almost like ceremonial. It's going to be kind of symbolic, if you will. He knows that. So he's making the case that essentially I am willing to accept all the risk that I, I am willing to accept people telling me that you have a liar in your caucus, that you have somebody who's a crook because I need that person in my caucus because this caucus is so close. If three or four others, if three or four Republicans were to resign, were to die, were to become Democrats, I'm no longer Speaker of the House. And we saw during the, um, certainly just a couple of weeks ago, that Kevin McCarthy will go full throttle and do just about anything he wants to become Speaker of the House. Now he is there. He is not going to essentially forego or abnegate the throne so that um, Democrats can take, so that a few, um, so that Democrats can take over and Congressman Jeffries is all of a sudden the minority, is all of a sudden the Speaker of the House. Will Lyons <laughs> makes a point. Basically, uh, how many jobs would allow someone with a lying record like George Santos to, to get the gig? Or if you want to apply for any job anywhere and on your resume, you say, yeah, I lied about this and this and this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, no, the no, how many? Perfect. The answer is zero jobs he would get, which 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 says without saying it that the legislature is a, not the most honorable gr group of people. Shock, shock! There's gambling in that casino. Yeah, uh. <laughs> like really, like you like to think of them a little bit honorable, but they're the only person that's the, that's the only place where a lying sob like George Santos could get a gig. So what what you have is a real basket of deplorables. There, I said it over there in the Capitol building. Well, it reminds me a little bit of John Lakian. John Lakian was a front runner for the governorship in, in Massachusetts back in 1982. The Boston Globe did an expose. He was a Republican, probably going to be the Republican nominee. And they found that he basically lied about battlefield promotions in Vietnam, that he had taken courses at Harvard. He originally protested it. Then later on, he kind of did a mea culpa. And in 1994, he comes back and runs for the United States Senate, spends $3 million of his own money, runs against Mitt Romney. And they talk to his press secretary, and his press secretary basically says, that we all essentially make mistakes and the best people are the people who learn from mistakes. So that's how he essentially tried to present himself. He garners 18% of the vote and Mitt Romney wins the nomination. But in the case of George Santos, I mean, that is a very legitimate question. If he were to resign today, what job would he get? I mean, would he be able to be a commentator on One America? I don't know if they would even necessarily hire him. Um, maybe someplace would hire him just because um, just because of the notoriety they would get for it. But the only people, you know who's really benefited from this whole George Santos scandal? Baruch College. Because that's where he said that he went as his alma mater. And oh, now right. everybody knows that they have won 11 volleyball championships. How many people even knew that except a small coterie of volleyball devotees? So if I were Baruch College, if I were in the public relations right now, this is how I would advertise it. I would say something to the effect of when Congressman George Santos who wants to represent the most the wealthiest district in the entire state of New York, one of the most highly educated, wanted to make up an alma mater. He could have picked Harvard. He could have picked Princeton. He could have picked Yale. Instead, he chose us. Well, he, there must have been a tactical reason for that. He got a 3.9 on his GPA there, accordingly, also, he said, which is very uh, interesting. But I think Baruch College is really... Now people point, know how great of a school it is. 2.9, you're right. He could have lied and said he got a 3. Uh, seven. No, a 3.9 he said he got. Oh, a 3.9. But he, he had, yeah, he lost. He was also, he also said he had two knee replacements because he was playing on the um, championship volleyball team. For the record, I went to University of New Hampshire and did not score very well because I, I didn't really apply myself. But I did learn a lot there. Okay, back to Donald Trump. Yes. Um, I'm never clear on the, the uh, difference between irony and coincidence. But I think this might approach irony. Would it be possible that Donald Trump will use this very same people that he allowed to get in power, the Freedom Caucus, that, that, that are basically election deniers? He's going to use them to appear reasonable at this point. And an example of that is his recent, his recent coming out and saying, is he recently coming out and saying, I don't want to touch entitlements. Do not touch Social Security and Medicare. Say so now he gets the position them as nut jobs, and he can seem reasonable. 
Is yeah. That, is he going to do that on purpose? And and this suckers, they're still supporting him. He's not going to call. Yeah, he's not going to call them nut jobs. He's going to, he's going to say this. And this is what he said going going back to 2015, 2016. He always knew that in order for him to win the nomination, to win the presidency, his voters were not going to be essentially, or not going to be systems analysts who are members of yacht clubs and country clubs. They're going to be blue collar conservatives. In order to win them over, as they always say, he has to essentially co-opt the Democrats on entitlements and say, I'm not going to take away your social security. I'm not going to take away your Medicare. But yeah, that absolutely benefits him. Just like it benefits him actually to have supported Kevin McCarthy because now all of a sudden he's presenting himself as a somewhat of a mainstream figure. And there are all these fringe figures over here, like Matt Gates and Lori Bobart and Bob Good and all these other Republicans who I supported. And they're essentially now too far right. So, and certainly that will certainly benefit him in the presidential election. But that being said, if Donald Trump is the nominee, I don't see where, I don't see any voters he actually gains. I don't see who, if he's, right. actually, yeah, exactly. where is it, where is there any voter who's kind of on the fence right now, but says, well, I just heard what Donald Trump said there about social security. You know what? I think I'm going to go with him. On the one hand, there are those who essentially believe it's almost, a, almost, a, he's almost a divine figure. There's no guard but Donald Trump. You cannot criticize him. On the other, there are those that essentially think that he is the most truculent dictator in America, dictator in the history of the world. So very few people actually in the center. You know, he's very much a dichotomous figure. Right. So uh, that bodes poorly for him because he lost last time and he's not going to get any more votes. And he may even shed some due to January 6th. Right. That's going to. Um, I don't even know about how much January 6th is going to make is going to make that much of an impact in terms of his actual voters. I think that there's about 40 percent that under almost no circumstance will they leave him unless perhaps he's actually is sitting in a gurney. If he's I mean, sorry, if he actually is sitting in a prison cell, which I don't think is going to be the case. But if he actually is sitting in a prison cell, then potentially they may go for somebody else. But in the primary, there are those who like his policies, who may have voted for him. And I'm talking about kind of upscale Republicans, but don't want all the baggage. Those are the ones that the other Republicans that are running against him are going to try to galvanize the support with, basically saying, just like Gov- Governor Yunkins did in Virginia when he ran last time, he basically distanced himself from Donald Trump, the person, while mm-hmm. hugging Donald Trump for Donald Trump, the for the policies of Donald Trump, which I think were relatively popular with the conservatives in the state of Virginia. And if he runs for president this time, I think he's going to essentially try that exact same platform to basically say, I'm not, I'm Donald Trump, but I'm kind of a less, I don't have the rhetorical hyper, hyperbole that Donald Trump certainly, um, certainly has. Right. Uh, now, backing up to something we nudged up to a little while ago, a running mate, Taylor Green is angling to yes, be number yeah. two. Uh, now that would be I think you mentioned that would the, the the left feels that would be the best thing that could happen to them what do you think yeah oh that oh my gosh I mean just showing all the, everything that she said about um, just, Correct. it's actually it, on tape you can see her you can see her talking about saying talking about QAnon saying Q's a patriot um, you can see her talking about you know a coterie of Jewish of Jewish people that are starting wildfires yeah. About Clinton's had John F. Kennedy Jr. killed so that Hillary could run for a Senate seat. Um, talking about Pizzagate. Yeah, that would be an absolute dream come true. Um, now, the only way Donald Trump, I think, actually chooses her is if somehow he's just out to try to get the Republican Party. This is just a complete self-destruction. Or he becomes an independent. Someone else wins the Republican nomination. And he says, you know what? I'm just going to really screw over the Republican Party. I'm going to run as independent, and I'm going to pick her as my running mate. I cannot envisage a scenario. Donald Trump, if he's running, Donald Trump hates losers. He hates being seen as a loser. He, he'll do anything not to be a loser. So the idea that he would pick a former QAnon supporter, somebody who believes the QAnon conspiracy theory, who believes that the Clintons had John F. Kennedy Jr. killed, how that's going to appeal to anybody other than Trump's ultra base is beyond me. If he's looking for a female, you know, there are other people that are conservative. Kim Reynolds, for example, the governor of um, the governor of Iowa. I mean, there are certainly others that he could choose from, but I don't see a scenario. Marsha Blackburn, a senator from Tennessee, where she actually um, gets the nomination and lets it's just kind of a suicide 
Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a suicide pack. Um, Donald Trump has, and he just wants to kind of bring the Republican Party down with him. Lola Pope makes an interesting point. She says that she, that he won't pick up anybody with any mojo or charisma or anything because he wants to be the top dog. Is that true? Would he, would that would that be cutting off his nose to spite his face? Um, no, of? I think he might. I think he would be willing to kind of swallow that and pull his nose if it means he thinks he can actually win. Nobody's going to overshadow, overshadow Donald Trump. Right. I can't think of anybody that he would possibly pick as a running mate that everyone's going to essentially go and say, look at this person. The way the last time I remember it, Sarah Palin. Um, Sarah Palin overshadowed John McCain. Um, people were automatically going and saying, where's Sarah Palin going? You know, Geraldine Ferraro, because she was the first female on a major party ticket, probably started to overshadow um, to, to, to overshadow the party's nominee that year, Walter Mondale. Theodore Roosevelt, because he once gave 19 speeches in a day, started to overshadow William McKinley. Um, in this case, I can I would say he would get anybody that I think he thinks is going to win. I'll say the last time around, when he was looking for a running mate, came down to Newt Gingrich, Chris Christie, and Mike Pence. And Mike Pence was somebody who was running for re-election as governor of Indiana and who had actually supported Ted Cruz over him in the primary and was about tied for re-election at that point. Not particularly popular in his home state, but he was very good with the evangelicals, and Donald Trump knew that he needed to shore up his support with the evangelicals. So some of his advisors said, "You have to choose Mike Pence." Not a particularly, um, not a particularly charismatic figure, but he nope. did help him with the evangelicals. I yeah. think Donald Trump will look from a cold, calculating perspective. He will say, "What benefits me politically? How can I win this?" He will take polls, yeah. and that's when he will choose somebody that will. For his, for his sake, someone that will galvanize the base and potentially, I mean, you'd say, can you, can there, are there any actual swing voters you can actually win over, or you just have to go, you know, can you just get the base only type of a situation, but you go as far as Marjorie Taylor Greene, you're really giving the Democrats a lot of ammunition. Can you imagine in a debate, if the Democrats say someone like, the Democrat nominee looks at Marjorie Taylor Greene when they have, a, they have a, when they ask, a, when they ask a question to the opponent and says, why did you say this and have a direct quote of what, of her essentially talking about how Q is a patriot and how she has to defend herself? I mean, it would be the the, the political theatrics of her being the nominee would be astronomical. Sure. It would be elephantine, I don't think. <laughs> I love your lexicon. <laughs> what? Uh, so who would he try? If you were to guess right now, who would he pick? Governor Reynolds of Iowa would be one, I would think. Um, she's somebody who I think because the Republicans had her deliver the uh, response to President Biden's uh, for okay. President Biden's State of the Union address that would be one. Christine Nome, the governor of South Dakota, would be another that I would think that he would potentially be looking at. I think if he's looking for a female, Marsha Blackburn. If he's not looking for a female, I'm thinking Tim Scott, potentially the senator from South Carolina, who's going to run, for, who's likely to run for president himself. But he's probably going, he's probably going to not going to have a lot of hostilities against Donald Trump directly. But he's somebody. He's an African American. Um, somebody that I think Donald Trump that I think Donald Trump would would have a relatively good relationship if he were to be the to be the nominee. He's also somebody who's kind of can be both the both a supporter of the insurrectionist right. wing as well, if you will, of the um, establishment bloodline of the Republican Party. So on the other side, yes. When I'm thinking who might oppose Trump, it's it's really important to get someone who can handle him on a debate stage, and. To me, do you think that's important? But just yeah. answer that as a yes or no when you, yeah. as part of the rest. Who could that be? Because I think, well, is, is Joe Biden too old, slow, and doddering to do that? Because he does have the old school chutzpah to do it if he's sharp enough. And if not, Joe, who else would have that ability? Elizabeth Warren would not have that ability. Um, well, Elizabeth would, Warren. Uh, well, you know. The vice president might. She was a prosecutor. What do you think? Uh, yeah, and in, in the well, in, the, in Joe Biden's case, I'll start with Joe Biden. Assuming Joe Biden does run, I think he's going to have de minimis opposition. Marianne Williamson is probably the only person that's really going to run against him. I think the Democrats are so unified to defeat the Republicans this time that there will be an all an, a full scale effort, full throated, to make certain to make it a categorical imperative, if you will that no major Democrat runs. And if they do, they garner absolutely no support. They don't want this to be 1980 on the Democrat side when Jerry Brown and Ted Kennedy challenged Jimmy Carter or 
Gerald Ford lost. Gerald Ford had Ronald Reagan challenge him in 1976. In both cases, it really hurt them in the general election or Pat Buchanan challenging Bush in 1992. So, no, I don't think there's going to be a major a major candidate running against them. I, will, I don't underestimate Joe Biden. I think that certainly that's the master narrative that a lot of folks are making, that Joe Biden is certainly too old. And they're going to, you know, you hear it all the time. You hear he has Alzheimer's, everything else. But he's still making all these trips overseas. And while you may hear him stuttering, you may hear him talking over his words. The fact of the matter is, at least in the last debate against Donald Trump, he did do relatively well. Um, and there are there is president, whether it's Lord Goldstone, you know, in um, in England or Conrad Attenauer in, um, Ger- in, in in Germany for people actually being the leaders of their country going well into their 80s. So there is precedent for that. If he doesn't run Kamala Harris, I don't see where her constituency is. A lot of people on the left are not going to like her because she's a former prosecutor and because of her role in terms of prosecuting uh, marijuana use when she was um, the DA in California. She also, when she first ran, her platform was had enough and basically said that her predecessor, who she defeated, the incumbent who she actually used to work for, was essentially too soft on crime. She kind of ran. Um, she kind And she also, by the way, is somebody who never garnered much support with minority communities, even as a minority when she ran for president herself. Joe Biden was absolutely was absolutely killing her with the African American community, so she did not do well yeah. with any particular constituency. So who else could potentially? She's got well, no. Bottom line, she's got no charisma. Yeah, but you can win without charisma. There, I mean, there are people that you can you can. Be, I don't think Jimmy Carter had a lot of charisma. No, I was going to say, but Jimmy he, Carter, he, wanted, I don't he, think he um, did not have charisma. There must have been other factors that allowed him to. Well, yeah, I'll tell you why. Sucked Jimmy Carter, into the presidency. Well, like, yeah, he was in the perfect. He was the perfect person at the perfect time, because this is right after Vietnam, right after Watergate, and the Church Committee hearings found out all that the United States was responsible and the CIA for all these essentially killing foreign leaders going back to Iran in '53 with Mossadegh and Guatemala in '54. People had distrust in their government, so they didn't. They wanted somebody completely outside of the completely outside of Washington. Jimmy Carter was a had served two terms in the state senate. One term as governor of Georgia, he had been in the Navy, he went to Annapolis, he was a businessman, and he was a born-again Christian, and he said, I'm untainted by Washington. He was there in the right place at the right time. People did not want somebody who was charismatic. He had primary opponents that year. He had Fred Fred Harris running very much of a populist, a precursor to Bernie Sanders, establishment folks like Scoop Jackson. You had kind of very populist candidates like um, George Wallace running that year. So you had a litany of other people running, but Pete, the Democratic Party essentially wanted somebody who was outside of Washington. It just worked for Jimmy Carter that time. But Jimmy Carter certainly did not win because of his charisma. And Gerald Ford, his opponent, was kind of had, I guess you could say, moderate charisma. He tried to certainly have charisma sometimes, but he didn't. He was not necessarily a um, a champion of charisma. So you had two charismatically challenged candidates kind of running against each other. So all things being equal, Jimmy Carter, a former one-term governor of Georgia, defeated Gerald Ford, who had been 25 years in the United States Congress, a former vice pre- a vice president, a president, somebody who, you know, had a lot more. Um, by the way, one thing that's very interesting about Ford, because you see politicians oftentimes will pretend they're one of us, like, you know, like um, Mitt Romney trying to pretend he was a, he was a lifelong hunter. It never works out. Twice or Kerry going into a shop and saying, is this where you can get me a hunting license? When it Ford never ran, works out. When Ford ran for Congress the first time around in 1948, get Republican Bartel Jonkman. There's a picture of this. I've seen pictures of farmers. Farmers are there, three farmers. Gerald Ford doesn't go any dressing up like a farmer. Gerald Ford was a lawyer. He dressed in a suit and tie, went on the farms, and met the farmers where they were, and they accepted that, and he continued. He got elected 13 more, 13 times, essentially. So it just yeah. shows if you do this kind of micro-pandering and you pretend you're one of us, um, usually the us will not accept that. They just are not any zip. Democrats don't tend to generate charismatic, interesting, powerful speakers. You know, where are all the James Carvels is my main question. There's one. All the rest of the James Carvels are on the right. There well, are no there are. I, think, I think Cory Booker would be one, I would say. It's very Okay, correct. good. Whatever uh, it takes. You need somebody who understands how to take the gloves. Democrats seem hamstrung by civility in debates, whereas Trump's not. It's, it's you know, trying to win with a hand tied behind your back. You, you need somebody not hamstrung by civility to say, shut your fat mouth, you lying bastard, <laughs> or something well, like that. <laughs> I, think, I think Bill Clinton, I think I'd love to see Bill Clinton debate Donald Trump. Um, what are the rules on you know, coming back again 
can't do Clinton can't come back. I, no, I, not, not at all. No, you can serve. Now, here, it's an interesting constitutional question. You can li- you can only serve two full terms. Now, there there is a limit in terms of how many terms you can serve part of somebody else's term. Like LBJ, for example, served the end of Kennedy's term, then served his own term. If he, he could have run in '68, he would have been constitutionally permissible. The question the constitutional scholars um, debate ad nauseum is: Can Clinton then become a vice president, a vice presidential nominee for someone, and then if they win, become vice president? Because the Constitution says you can only serve two terms for eight years as president. So if Bill Clinton were to become vice president and then that president were to die, does that mean that it would essentially have to skip over him and then go to the secretary of state? There are some people who think that there's a loophole there that a former president could serve in that respect. It used to be that a president could serve unlit, uh, could serve as long as as long as possible. Ulysses S. Grant served Joe two Roosevelt, terms. Roosevelt, right? Well, Ulysses S. Grant tried to serve. He didn't run for a third term in 1876. Then he ran all over the world, all over the world, spent two years on a world tour, garnered acclamation everywhere. In 1880, they put his name up on the ballot. To, they put his name up at the convention to run for a third term. He didn't get it. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, he put his name up. He, he ran again for a third term as a member of the Bull Moose Party, the Progressive Party. He didn't get it. In 1940, Franklin Roosevelt, who was the incumbent, did run for a third term, and he got it. And then after that, essentially, um, the 22nd Amendment was put into play, which says that a president cannot serve more than two terms. It may be that there's such. Well, do you do you see a dearth of talent in the on the left, the Democratic side? And if so, maybe it's good to get a real moderate Republican as president. No, I, I don't. I think that actually there are a lot of um, sort of um, there are, there are some Congress people that I would that if I were the Republicans, I would say were very redutable. One of them would be. Alice, uh, Congressman Spanberger, former military, former intelligence um, from Virginia, that would be someone that I would probably be afraid of somewhat. Amy Klobuchar would be somebody from this senator from Minnesota, simply because she's somebody who I think could galvanize, could gal- could galvanize this, could certainly galvanize that vital center Bill Clinton always talked about. Um, I think that certainly in terms of who else would be, who else would be, a, would be, a, would, I think Cory Booker, if he could, he's somebody who does, who does very well in terms of speaking and galvanizing. Um, supporters. His problem is he's never married many people's actual first choice. And he started this last time around. He wasn't a lot of people's uh, first choice when he ran for the nominee for the not when he ran for um, the nomination. And as a result, he didn't get he didn't really get anywhere. But I think that Go- Governor Gretchen Whitmer of uh, Michigan is somebody I certainly um, I, cer- I certainly would I certainly would look at. I think Governor Cooper of North Carolina is somebody who is probably I think the best candidate the Democrats have. But his problem is there's a Republican lieutenant governor, and every time the Democratic governor is out of state in North Carolina, the Republican becomes governor. So Governor Cooper has to somehow get out of that. But I think he's somebody who's very, in many respects, has the word vice president written all over him, in part because he's been able to win a state that is very rare in this day and age, where he's able to win a state that Donald Trump is also able to win in terms of twice, in terms of North Carolina. And he was elected 16 years as attorney general prior to that. When do these potential candidates tend to pop you know, pop up? What What is the optimum time frame? Right about now. Yeah. Got some exceptions. Phil Crane announced in 1970, in 1978 before the midterms. Governor Peter Paul DuPont announced in 1986 before the 1988 race. He was the governor of Delaware. But normally right around anywhere from February to May is when the candidates tend to announce their candidacies. I think Bill Clinton actually did it the best when he did it in 1990. After promising not to do it in 1990, when he ran for re-election, he went through an entire legislative session, looked at looked at the political horizon, and then he figured out that George H. W. Bush was vulnerable. And he ends up announcing on October 15th of 1991, just a few months before the New Hampshire primary. So there may be someone late, but my guess is that right now, certainly on the Democratic side, they're all waiting for Joe Biden. If Joe Biden does not does not run. You're going to see 743 people, but who's counting, essentially get into the race in the Republican side. I think that even with Donald Trump running, a lot of Republicans are still going to get into the race because they see him as very vulnerable. Um, I think uh, if he if, certainly if he were not to be in the race, you would see probably triple that many. But um, I think right now, a lot of Republicans are just basically it's just can I raise the money? Do I have a message that resonates? And if not, can I change it? Can I transmogrify it so it does resonate? with a certain group, what constituencies do I appeal to? And I think that's really what the candidates are looking at right now. But on the Democratic side, if Joe Biden says, yes, I'm in there, I really don't see 
a scenario where a major Democratic presidential candidate also throws their hat in the ring. Okay, two more questions. One, yes. do you think Donald Trump would run, be running if he were not on the edge of indictment? Do you think he's running just for legal cover? I don't really I, get the yeah. sense he, he, what's that? Yeah, I don't know. I thought about that. Um, I do know that for somebody, just if, the, if, if this, if there were, if there were no legal issues involved, Cedar is para, but all things being equal, um, he does not want to be, he does not like losers. Okay. He could, from history, he could say this. If you take away all the financial benefits, everything else that potentially would benefit him financially and just take it from a political standpoint, he could make the case that I've won two elections, but they stole the last one from me. If he runs this time around and loses and loses in a landslide, it'd be very hard for him to make that case. And I've never seen Donald Trump actually declare himself, you know, he's never, I've never really seen him concede anything. He conceded Iowa caucuses to Ted Cruz, maybe that's about the closest, you know, but um, if that were the case, if this were, if the, you can make the scenario, case scenario that if there were no financial issues and there were no, um, possibility of him going to prison that maybe he would just be better off to say you know i run the i won the last two elections i should be serving president i should be president right now i should be president right now and not actually run he's taking a risk and part of the risk too is what if he actually loses the republican nomination not to mention the fact that now he has to punch down in politics you always punch up some guys at five percent of the vote and that person's going after donald trump donald trump's gonna have to respond to that guy that's at five percent of the vote and it really does not it's really unbecoming on a um, former president to be going after, um, to be going after, you know, somebody who's the, um, some someone who's, you know, the who's the who's who's the who's the governor who's the, who's the governor of a state, for example. Right. Trump never seemed to be a person who worried about being unbecoming, though. Well, I, I actually remember Mitt Romney used that word against Shannon O'Brien in 2002 during a debate, and the next day the big headlines were Mitt Romney, a male, calls Shannon O'Brien a female, unbecoming. I guess that's where this word kind of got into my membrane somewhere, uh. but. Um, no, Donald Trump does not like losers. And if he loses this, if he loses this in a landslide, how is he going to say that he won? Um, it's, you know, I guess theoretically he could just get out of the Republican Party and say, you know, it's rigged against me and then run as an independent. And then if he loses um, and if then if he, the Democrat ends up winning, he could say something like, well, I may, well, we would have won, though, if you would pick me as a nominee. So essentially it's the Republican Party's fault, not mine. Okay, I'm going to end up with a trivia question for you. Oh. And you can give you can give me a trivia question. You go for actually, you give me one first because I never get them right. I don't care. Give me one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. What would be a good one? Okay. In 1992, at the Democrat in the Democratic uh, presidential debate, one candidate came after Bill Clinton for allegedly had his his wife Hillary Clinton had benefited from his her the Rose Law Firm where she worked had benefited from. Um, her, from his work as governor. Bill Clinton looks at him and says, you come up here with these $1,500 suits. You don't belong in the same stage as my wife. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You came, you wanted me to run, you you asked me to, you, you were running for president one time and you asked me to support you. And they said, did you? And he said, no, I don't. And this went absolutely excoriated the guy. Who am I talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I give up. He has a colorful last name and he was a former governor of California. Brown. Yes, Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown, who ran three times he ran in 1976 as a stock Carter candidate, ran in 1980 against Jimmy Carter, then then ran for a Senate seat in 1982, comes back in 1992. And if you watch this exchange on YouTube, one of the best exchanges I've ever seen between Bill Clinton and Jerry Brown, they're kind of going after each other. But then when Jerry Brown needed Bill Clinton again in 2010, Bill Clinton came on and campaigned for him. And interestingly, Jerry Brown, the Democratic Party, let him address the convention, thinking that he was going to endorse Bill Clinton. His entire speech in 1992 his entire speech was about campaign finance reform, and he never mentioned the word Bill Clinton. But that's Ooh. a thing rivalry. And they had been governors at one time together. And after Bill Clinton lost the governorship in 1980, Jerry Brown actually offered Bill Clinton a job working on his staff in California, which Bill Clinton roundly rejected. And then they had a really bitter rivalry in 1992. Hmm. All right. For you, who, who was the most recent president to be shorter than the national average of heights oh i would say carter it was ha it was a harrison i think benjamin harrison i know that william henry harrison was the shortest president ever right no no that was no james monroe oh all right but benjamin harrison was also very short so and i think i'm gonna say the first president you come to going back that was shorter than the national average of the time oh i thought you meant okay uh, uh, and that shorter than the yeah, that okay. I know because Harrison, 
so Harrison, his grandfather was William Henry Harrison. And Benjamin Harrison, they used to have a pitch. There was a, the Cleveland campaign had these um, kind of, they would, they they had this cartoon. It was actually sometimes, sometimes independent of the Cleveland campaign. And it'll be Benjamin Harrison trying to wear his father's hat. And he'd be sitting there with his father's hat on, but his hat would be too big for him. I think Bear Harrison was actually the second uh, youngest president. I mean, the second rather, um, okay. so, rather so, um, Right. President. So the question was, how yeah. far do you have to go back before you get a president shorter than the national yeah. average at the time? And yeah. I think it's Benjamin Harrison, Benjamin Harrison. But you can correct me next week if I'm no, wrong. I mean, that would make sense. He was other than Monroe. He was pretty much the uh, smallest uh, president. And incidentally, James Monroe was five four. And Amy Klobuchar, who ran for president last time around, uh, was also uh, was also five four. But Benjamin Harrison, he was called the he was called the Indiana Icicle, and he was the first president to attend to attend a major league baseball game while in office. So the reason I happen to see that is that it was a it was a TV show, I guess that was, or somebody was making the point that to be tall is a huge advantage in our culture, and yeah. that short short people. Uh, are at a disadvantage and proof of that or, or some evidence of that was hey look how many short presidents there there were not many you have to go pretty far back to find one shorter than the national average that's an inter uh, that's an interesting proposition and i largely agree with that um i remember for example certainly george hw bush certainly overpowered mike dukakis in 1988 when you saw him in that debate and like the caucus almost looked kind of like a diminutive figure simply because um of his height i remember robert reich the former labor secretary yeah who was 411 he remember he ran for governor in 2002 and he was making fun of his height and um it actually became an issue because some people who actually um there were there were some there were some people who were saying that potentially he's kind of making fun of small people so he kind of had to kind of apologize um for it but he was kind of trying to trying to kind of use it uh, to his advantage and he actually had a show with alan simpson who was about seven feet tall who was before he was ran for governor that is who was the former senator from wyoming and they called it the long of it and the short of it all right well we've gone an hour and seven minutes so i probably better stop because i need to save something for next time show us your book yes oh yes this is rich rubino's one of his, his five books is called The Great American Political Trivia Challenge. And that's he's got all kinds of trivia questions in there. Fun to sit around the fireplace and uh, uh, play trivia with your family. <laughs> or Political you, trivia. Political uh, trivia, yes. Political trivia with your family. No, it's a cool, cool book. It's packed. And, I, and once again, I'm surprised that you are not working for a political campaign because, you know, uh, history matters when you're trying to figure out what to do in the future and you'd be a value i think so yes. thank you very much rich rubino we'll speak again soon yes indeed thank you so much for having me on again all righty bye all